everybody. How's it going? Good. Welcome. Welcome to uh, March 2023. The Houston Sabre chapter meeting. Uh, if you don't know who I am, Joe Thompson. Mike is not here to correct me, so uh, let Mike know that I introduced myself, please. <laughs> um, we've had an interesting uh, month, haven't we? So uh, I'm still playing catch up. Uh, if maybe some of you knew or didn't know, uh, I was on my anniversary trip last week with my wife. We went on a cruise, and I was literally disconnected from the world for a week. So I did not hear about Altuve until Saturday. And let me tell you, are we worried now, Astro fans? I asked this question last month with McCullers. You know, so are we worried now? A little bit. They're saying Hinchley is going to play second. Okay. All right. Well, we'll we'll see how it goes. Um. All right, so uh, those of you online, I want to welcome uh, Wesley, Brownie, owner Carl, whoever that is. I've seen that name before. And uh, David, welcome. Um, I see. Uh, I see in the background is a copy of your. Uh, the background is the copy of David's book. I have a copy of David's book right there, but it's being, it's sitting at the camera sitting on it. So I can't <laughs> tell you a copy of the book. Uh, I actually have two copies of your book, David, because when I got back from my trip, um, come to find out Amazon delivered the package early. And Friday it was raining cats and dogs, right? So I opened the package when I got here, and the book was soaking wet, David. Is that the one you're using for a camera prop? No. <laughs> so I called Amazon and said, hey, I can't read this. <laughs> so they sent me another one, and I got to get So I'll write Amazon. So I have to send Literally them the fixed. So I technically have two copies. Of one of them I can't read. But I'll send it back to Amazon tomorrow. <laughs> But I can't wait to read uh, David's book. If you haven't got a copy of it, uh, I'll, I'll show it here in a minute. It's uh, Labor of Love, right? There. It so sure like, was. It sure is. Yeah. So thank, thank anybody, you for uh, thank you for buying that book, Joe. Anybody started reading David's book yet? Anybody got a copy of Bill Burton's book or the Bill Burton book? I'll, I'll, I'll pass it around. So, uh, all right. So. As you can tell, Chris is not here. Chris usually handles all this. All right? So the setup you're seeing now is really kind of makeshift. All right? Chris said I'm not going to be here. I had to run out by a projector, and the first one I brought didn't work. <laughs> so I had to run back to Best Buy, and uh, the guy said, why don't you use this one? And it was six hundred dollars cheaper. <laughs> I said, "Yeah, yeah, I'll use that one." <laughs> so, uh, well, we'll see what we can do. He's like, "Well, a lot of businesses use this one." I said, "Okay, I'll take your word for it." So we're gonna see how it goes. All right, and I like the price of this one a lot better. So um, this is not as fancy as uh, Chris's setup. So I hope it works for everybody. All right, and hopefully, Chris, uh, if you're listening, please come back next month. <laughs> All right. So we got a few online. Uh, Oh, we got a few new members that Chris told me about. Um, Cole Baggett, anybody here? Cole Baggett, uh, I'm gonna call your name. Marina. Uh, she, yeah, she's on her way back to uh, from Israel, actually. Right. She'll be here later tonight. Yeah. Well, I mean, not in the meeting, but yeah. Yeah. So, Jacob Cornwell. Anybody know Jacob? Um, doesn't say where Jacob's from. Tim Healy. 
Tim. There you go. New member right there. Tim Healy. Uh, Ian Fleppinger. No? Okay. Well, I need to get on the email and welcome these people. Say, hey, come to the meeting. Um, and again, those of you on Zoom. Um, in case you don't know, you got a few extra hundred dollars that you want to spend on Astros gold uniforms. They go on sale. I've heard of the Midnight Magnet sale, right? March 22nd from midnight until 59 p.m. the next day. Yeah, or the next night. So uh, if you want to get your uh, 2022 Astros gold, I don't know, uniforms and pay whatever you want to pay for them. Anybody going to buy one? The gold thing? I got a gold hat last time, so I guess I'll get a gold hat. So face that, I guess. I don't know. I just heard the Astros have been promoting this gold thing for the last couple of days, you know. So uh, it's there. I think it's March 22nd. You can at the store. I guess I was looking at fanatics, but uh, yeah, apparently you got to go to the store. I mean, do any, anybody know anything different? Any Mike? You know how it works, Mike? Okay. Well, there you go. They're going to open the doors at midnight, I guess. That's so, yeah, the Astros keep 100% of that. Right? Speaking, of the, yeah, speaking of the Astros keeping 100%, are we concerned about the uh, RSN problem? The AT&T Sports Southwest going away? The Diamondback, I mean, you know, it's Armageddon out there on social media. We're not going to be able, nobody's going to be able to watch games. MLB is trying to come in and save the season so people can watch games. But what I've read, we really shouldn't have that problem, right? Because we have a contract with DirecTV for, for 2032 or something like that. So, but they have until March 31st to negotiate something. Basically, the word is Warner Brothers wants to get out of the RSN business. Okay, so what does that mean for us? I hope we can still watch it. But it's going to ultimately go, go. Don't the Red Sox have a thing where you pay like 20 bucks a month and you get everything? And that's the model the Astros are going after? Or something like that? Yes, the RF. It's in problem. Uh, the word is. Jim Crane is in negotiations for the Astro, uh, the Astros and Rockets are in negotiations to buy the channel or something like that. So we shouldn't, hopefully we shouldn't have a problem. Unless I'm getting that all wrong. Please correct me. I've been on a ship for a week, so. I'm going to be told in the first game and second game. Then they'll go back to the regular. Then they'll go back to the regular? Two games? Uh, wearing, wearing the gold uniform. That's all? Yeah, well, they may wear other special games. Right now, it's going to be opening night and Friday. Okay. Well, I'll be at the Friday night game. So, um, I guess I'll be one of the few people that see it this year. I don't know. Um, okay. Uh, we can talk about Altuve for a second if you want. But we uh, again <laughs> eight to ten weeks. That's what we're hearing, right? Okay. Eight to ten weeks. Okay. Um, I have uh, I sent out a couple weeks ago uh, before I left about the uh, Larry Durker chapter uh, Astros win contest. All right. This year we're having. In the past, we've always had send whatever you think the Astros are going to win the win total. And the tiebreaker is usually the Skeeters slash Space Cowboys win total. Okay. But this year I thought we'd have a little, I'd, I'd mess around with it a little bit, have a little different wrinkle. Um, this year, uh, send myself or Herb, right? Herb, you're handling, are you getting some of these, Herb? 
Okay, I'm getting some already. Uh, this was pre Altuve, so I don't know if it's going to change. <laughs> but send your Astros win total, and I have had two tiebreakers this time. Also, send me how many home runs you think Jordan is going to hit this year. And as a second tiebreaker, how many stolen bases Kyle Tucker will have? Okay. And uh, I thought it would be neat because I heard some guys talking on the radio and TV with the new rule changes. Um, base stealing might really become a thing this year. Okay. And I hope so. And they mentioned Kyle Tucker's name specifically. So I hope Tuck can uh, steal quite a few bases. It's going to be a thing for bank. Yeah. It's going to be hard to It'll be hard. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, send your Astros win total, your Jordan home run total, and your Kyle Tucker stolen base total to Herb or myself by first pitch on opening day. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to do it tonight, just give them to Herb tonight. Yeah. What a great guy, Herb. Thank you, Herb. Uh, those of you online, if you wanted to do that, you can just put it in the chat and we'll, we'll remember. So, David, if you want to do it, Wesley, Brownie, you know, you guys. Um, last month, we had a great meeting. We had 43 people last month. It was a really outstanding meeting. Um, so, uh, Really great. We had a great time last month. Um, and looking forward to uh, maybe getting 43 more people again here pretty soon. The first two months, first two chapter meetings of the year were really outstanding. So um, next month, the meeting is April 17th. We're going to have Justin McKinney. He's going to talk about his book. He's the author of Baseball's Union Association, The Short, Strange Life of an Early. Major League. Now, in the past, we don't usually have meetings the same night there's a home game, but this this year's we're we're trying to work around it. Okay, but next month there's the Astros are playing the Blue Jays at home that night. Um, I'm working on a couple of other guests. Um, one of our other chapter members, Lou, uh, uh, um, pointed me towards some people from the Astros Foundation. Uh, I'm going to try to get them to come talk with us too. But um, for next month, we have uh, one, one speaker, Justin McKinney, who's going to talk to us. Uh, there's not going to be a May meeting, okay? Instead, on May the 13th, we're going to have a chapter night at Constellation Field. All right? We're all going to run in while Gerald and Mike are doing their broadcast and just kind of crash the party, all right? <laughs> no, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> we're not going to do that. But Mike McCroskey has set up a chapter day for Saturday, May the 13th. Uh, the Space Cowboys are playing the Chihuahuas, uh, El Paso. That is the AAA affiliate of the Padres. Okay. Uh, those interested in coming, it's $55. It includes dinner, tickets to the Insperity Club section, and a meeting before the game. We haven't got a speaker yet. But if you want to you want to come to the game, um, Send your money to Mike at his address. I've sent out the address. He, he has a Sugar Land address. Um, so he wants the money by May 1st. Okay. So I think we already have enough. Uh, I think 20 people have already, uh, at least 20 people have already said they're coming. But if you want to come, go ahead. Mike is also working on something for August at the Astros game. Okay. And August 12th. If anybody knows that day, that is the day Brownie and Bill Dorn will be inducted into the Astros Hall of Fame. Okay, Brownie, we can't see you, but we know you're there. <laughs> but we're working on something to have a chapter day at uh, Minute Maid Park on August the 12th. Okay, um, I, I, I have a couple of other people that Lou has, Lou's pointed me to that I can talk to with the Astros and maybe they can come talk to us uh, in, in August. Um, all right. Tony, yeah. chapter newsletter. 
We want it out by tax day, right? April 15th? Yeah. Hey, you want to? So, uh, if anybody is interested in uh, writing an article, if you have something in the can or if you're about, if you're even like moving away, you can send it over to us. Uh, we could use a lot of material, a lot of things happening. Of course, one of them being the you know, going on with the actual telecast, which is a very complex legal situation. Uh, the impact of these new rules, what's going to happen there, uh, all kinds of things going on. And um, baseball, baseball. Oh, I'm have a future because everybody's getting injured with sleep. Anyway, there's plenty of stuff there. Reminiscences while I was. We were, uh, what, and I were in Palm Springs, California. I ran into a guy, a minor leader, that he had a book. He's trying to help. I don't think he did it. He said, well, the low riders and six weeks, he had triple up on both sides. The ten and right hand, the same game. He said, that's got to be a record. Oh, it would be nice to have that confirmed. But if anybody's heard about it, I definitely would know. So let's uh, get something going. This is the hundredth anniversary of the first period of the Yankees the whole period as a winner. So things like that. Okay. Yeah, uh, I got some stories in mind. I'd like to send to uh, Tony. Uh, yeah. But if you've never, if you've never published before, if never, if it, if a baseball memory, a baseball story, anything, two, three hundred words, that's really not a lot. You know, just send to Scott, um, Scott McKay, you know, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not like you're going to send something in and you get a rejection letter from McFarland or somebody. <laughs> and I'm using McFarland because, uh, yeah, David's laughing, but here's a copy of David's book, okay? All right. The Bill Vernon book right here. Yes, yes. Ironically published by McFarland. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have to worry. I'll pass the book around if you want, want to look at it. Um, it's not like you're going to get a rejection letter or something. I mean, just tell, send something in interesting. Anything you can think of. And be sure all this stuff goes to the Hall of Fame. And all this stuff, stuff goes to the Hall of Fame. Okay, you got it, Tony. All right. Um, yeah, so send it in by uh, April 1st. That'd be fine. Yeah, yeah so you got plenty of time there. Um, <laughs> April 1st, right? April 1st? Well, you know, you might have a little change this, change that, a couple of words. Very, very liberal. As always. But we got to get it out soon, Tony. Got to get it out soon if we want to Astro's preview section or Astro's, Astro's preview edition or something. Want to get it out soon. I don't know. All right, very quickly, uh, registration for Sabre 51 is underway in Chicago. Please join me in Chicago. Anybody going? Sabre 51, Bob's going, Herb's going, Gloria's going, all the, all the girls are going. Uh, anybody else going to Chicago? Oh, come on. Don't you want to go to Chicago? All right. Uh, I'm going to go up a couple of days early to watch the Cubbies play uh, at Wrigley because I've never been to Wrigley. Uh, you get to go see a White Sox game if you register for Sabre 51. Um, there's the uh, Sabre members, it's 339 for the all inclusive package. That's the whole conference, that's the ticket to the game, that's uh, awards luncheon, welcome reception, all the great stuff you get in the convention. Um, downtown at the Palmer House, the Hill. And by the way, if you buy a copy of David's book, David said he will be up there and he will autograph it for you personally. Okay, so if you want to get a copy of that, is that still a thing, David? I'm not sure about that, Joe. Uh, I'm still trying to decide whether that's a go or not. Well, he told us last month he was going to. He said last month you were going to Chicago. Well, as my intent, but uh, we got a lot of traveling between now and then. Okay. Well, fingers crossed that David will be up there to autograph the burden book for you. 
and fingers or he'll just have to come down here and give us a presentation. I would, I would like to do that. Yeah, there we go. All right. So um, the deadline for the early registration is May 5th. So uh, get your money in. It, it's well worth it. As a group, we usually go out to dinner, have a great time. Maxwell, many of you know, who joins our meetings a lot, he's he's always there. So uh, it'd be a great time, you know, July 5th through the 9th. Right? Okay. Um, well, without further ado, we have two special guests tonight. And uh, one of them just started eating. <laughs> uh, so they don't have to talk together. <laughs> if, 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 uh, uh, but we have Gerald Sanchez and Mike Acosta. Um, I haven't known Gerald that long, but he's a great guy in my book because you went to U of H or you broadcast games for U of H? Both. All right. So he went to the University of Houston and he broadcast games for U of H. And you know me, I'm all about my coups, right? Who are going to, you know, who's going to win the NCAA championship this year, you know, in basketball, but that's me. All right. The horns guy, well, you know, horn down, right? Uh, so, uh, <laughs> but the coups are still in it. So, um, Gerald Sanchez, as many of you know, um, and I had it up here. How long have you been broadcasting games for the Space Cowboys, Gerald? Uh, this will be year number three. Year number three. Gerald's a native of Victoria, Victoria, Texas. Been in broadcasting almost, almost at 51 years, but 31 years, right? <laughs> uh, I didn't know this. You own a broadcast company called Legacy Sports Network? Sir. Wow. We got to talk about that. Um, it, it, it's internet based, specializing in high school football, basketball, and baseball. If you've been listening to any of the spring training games, maybe you heard Gerald's voice a couple of times. He broadcasts five games of spring training, um, down there, and uh, he's here with his broadcast partner, Mike. If you've been part of Saber for any period of time, you know, Mike, Mike has essentially been. I've, I've known Mike for as long as I've been a Sabre member, okay? Uh, that, that's how long I've known Mike. Um, Mike Acosta was the Astros historian. Anything you want to know about the Astrodome, ask Mike. Anything. I mean, I mean anything. <laughs> so, uh, he, you know, uh, it was my favorite stadium growing up, but if I want to just know anything about the Astrodome, all I got to do is ask him. Okay. Um, he spent, he's a Houston native. He spent 22 years with the Astros. He established the Astros Hall of Fame. All right. Because of him that we have this Astros Hall of Fame. He's broadcast baseball and football since 2001, high school, college, and the minor leagues, obviously, with the Space Cowboys. And uh, what I didn't know until recently, he has an online media company called Houston City Beat. That's still pretty new, ain't it, Mike? It's new. Uh, my involvement found in about three years. Okay. He creates original content that tells stories from around the Houston area. And he also uh, handles uh, branding and communications for two other companies. Um, a lot of that comes from his experience as being the authentic. Uh, Authentic, authentic, whatever that is. I told you I'm still on vacation. All right. <laughs> Authentication manager for the Astros, right? Is that kind of where some of that experience comes from? Uh, sort of. Yeah. I mean, yeah, branding communication is kind of an authentic. Yeah. A little different message. Yeah. Okay. Same theory. So I don't know how they want to do this uh, since Mike is still eating. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, let's. Uh, one or both of them come up. They're going to tell us a little bit about the Space Cowboy season, what we can expect, and uh, whatever else is on their mind. The floor is theirs. Oh, thank you. Go ahead, Gerald. Thank you. Good evening. I'm, I'm Gerald Sanchez. And I'm Mike Acosta. And this is Gerald Sanchez. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've been broadcasting uh, the uh, Sugarland Space Cowboys. I actually started when they were the Skeeters, 
And uh, my involvement with them happened when COVID happened. 2020, Roger Clements started a league with uh, minor league teams down in Sugarland, and they was really put together pretty quick uh, because minor league baseball wasn't having a season in 2020. So the, he, along with the uh, Sugarland baseball team, they put together the Constellation Energy League. And uh, they had four teams. And one of the, uh, the obviously, the Skeeters were team uh, managed by Pete Incavilia, former uh, big leaguer, former Astro. Dave Island was one of the managers, Roger and Kobe Clemens, and Greg Swindell. So they had the four teams. Those these guys that were uh, part of the uh, managing the uh, minor leaguers and got to see some good ball players come through there. And uh, I got to know the people in Sugarland and uh, and was able to interview for the job in 2021 and uh, was able to get it and uh, enjoyed broadcasting minor league baseball the last couple of years. Um, just today, the ball club made a decision. Uh, they wanted to put together the uh, the position of broadcaster, which I've been the primary broadcaster, along with media relations. They put the two together and they asked me if I was interested in applying because I have a company that broadcasts high school sports. That's my day job. That's my real job. But uh, I'm unable to, unable to, uh, to accept the offer from the uh, Space Cowboys. So they uh, have put me as the secondary broadcaster. They're going to bring in a new guy to be the, the primary broadcaster for the uh, Space Cowboys. So uh, I'll be doing the exhibition games to start and then... Coming up on uh, Friday, the 31st, is when they open against El Paso in El Paso. And uh, we will start uh, for them. He's coming from Double A Biloxi, Mississippi, which is the Milwaukee Brewers Double uh, A affiliate. So it's been a lot of fun. I'll be able to call the game still, some home games and a couple of innings, still to have my hand in, in, involved with the uh, the Space Cowboys. But had a blast calling the uh, Astros spring training and my college involvement with college baseball with the University of Houston. I'll do some rice and uh, with the college classic at Minute Maid, uh, the last couple of years, I've, I've done that as well. So um, I'm not going anywhere. I love baseball and I love to, to present it to the fan. There's always a story to tell. It's, it's always a lot of fun. And it seems like for the years that I've been in Houston since 2001, I've had this guy always by my side and he's always been a, a great help. One of the notes that Gerald and I discovered, and then this was just through, we, we were working, we did our first Space Cowboys games together. I went, you know what? We, we literally, we went, we've done high school together. We did junior college together. We've done New Beige, Rice, and now minor league at AAA. And, and we've done all those games. It's kind of cool. because I don't know too many other teams that have kind of gone through uh, a career kind of progressed on and yeah. we, all those games. I thought that was kind of an interesting note. And it just kind of occurred to me one night when we were sitting in the booth about ready to go on the air. And here's a little known fact. And I think it's so fitting that Mike is a part of this fact. But him and I called the very last baseball game ever played in the Astronaut. That was 2003. It was a high school baseball game. It was Elkins, which featured Matt Carpenter against Brazos, which it was a great game. And they, uh, the, it was the very last game ever to be played in the Astrodome for baseball. Yeah, that was really cool. This was a transition moment. You know, a lot of people don't realize that baseball was played, you know, a couple of years after the Astros left. And even though it was high school, it was very energetic because it was, it was the uh, postseason. So people coming kind of like the way they did with uh, high school football, of course, a smaller crowd. But people came into the Astrodome very energetic. It was really cool. And then kind of the same thing where we're just kind of in a situation that all of a sudden it dawns on you that this was going to be the last game that was played there. For the well, baseball. you know, and at the time, actually, we didn't know it was going to be the last game. And him and I, we just, well, that's true. We, yeah. we walked down in the fields, we walked around the mound. We really soaked it in, not knowing it was the last game, but we really soaked in being in the dome and calling that last game. Yeah, the uh, the games in the in the dome were always really special. See, Gerald and I have we grew up listening to Gene Elson and Milo Hamilton, and we have a 
we, we talk about this all the time. And now one of the projects that we, we have going on separate from everything else and kind of part through this media company that I own now is AstroTalk. And AstroTalk is a brand that I began actually about 10 years ago, where it was, it was basically information on the Astros, storytelling of the Astros, tidbits, this day in history type of thing. And it, it got a following. And it was a really good way to engage with Astros fans and, and kind of share stories and also get stories from people who had been at the games. And that's that was part of what I considered my education of the Astros, because in the job that I had, I was able to meet pretty much every player imaginable who was still alive, you know, who had done something for the Astros over the years. And you hear about that. And the best thing about working in baseball, and Gerald and I have talked about this and chime in. The best part of working in baseball are the good people that you meet and all the people that help you, the, the human beings, you know, you see these names, right? And you, you think of people as celebrities or, you know, players, big name players or whatever. But one of the most impactful things that happened to me was the very first year I was working for the Astros. And that was in 1999. And it was the very last uh, day of the season. And we had, a, so as a historian, I knew that I wasn't there in 1965 to see the Astronome open, but I was there at the very end. And so I wanted to document what was going on. And then I was going to plan, how would we document what's going to happen at the new ballpark the next year? So I got, to, it was a Sunday after, or Sunday game that afternoon. So I got to the Astronome extra early. I went to the radio booth because that's where I was working at the time. Uh, a lot of people weren't there yet. And put my books down, got my computer out, set up, and the media dining room was going to open. So I thought, okay, well, I'm going to go over there and grab something to eat real quick uh, so I can come back because we're going to have all these former players here. There's going to be a lot of stuff going on today that I really want to document. So I went in there. It was real quiet. The, uh, the Donald Davidson room at the Astrodome, a little bit bigger than this room. And uh, I sat down, got some bacon and eggs. It was really empty. Uh, there were some employees in there. ESPN was on the TV, so, you know, it's Sunday morning. And after a couple of minutes, uh, Vince Scully walks in. And so we were playing the Dodgers, right? And so Vince Scully came in, and he always wore that blue sports coat, right? In different variations, kind of that baby powder blue kind of uh, color. And I had gotten to know him a little bit over the course of the season because I was handling stats for the, for the radio booth, for the Astros radio booth and scores and so he saw me and mind you the whole room was nearly empty and he saw me and he came over and he said hey he goes do you mind if i join you and i was like <laughs> no i'm gonna leave now no uh no he sat down with me and we had breakfast that morning for about 20 minutes and it was like the best bacon and eggs that i ever had it was so cool it was so cool and, and that first season <clears throat> that I worked for the Astros out of 22, it left a big, that moment left a big impression on me because you think of Ben Scully and you think of all the history that he's been involved in, all the, the major games in the World Series, national telecasts, and broadcasts, working with Red Barber, you know, all his, his tenure with the Dodgers and everything. And he started talking about the Astrodome as a palace, what it's like, to come into it in 1965, what it was like to see AstroTurf for the first time. Uh, gee, he said it was just unbelievable, just telling these stories about Houston. And, you know, that was totally unexpected because, like I said, I always see this engagement with people, and this is what I still like to do today, um, as an education about the game. And I think that that, I, I like to absorb information and then recite these stories because I believe that's what we're all here to do, right? Is to help and, and do all that. But he sat there and we had this breakfast and then uh, that was it. And then we got up and, and we left and went back to the booth. And I was like, wow, I can't believe that that just happened. Uh, it was incredible. But for somebody like Ben Scully to come in and for me to not see him as Ben Scully, but see him as a gentleman, as a, as a good human, as a person who was willing, who, you know, he knew, I mean, he had to have known that I was, you know, I was 24 at the time. Uh, he had to have known that I was in my 20s that I was starting out because I was helping with stats. And then and I was bringing them over to the, to the visiting radio booth too sometimes. 
So he took that moment and he took that time. So that stayed with me. And Gerald and I, at times, both of us have engaged with younger people because for one of the things I think that, that baseball does to a person is that it keeps them young. Like for the longest time, you know, I, when I first started, <laughs> I was the same age as the players. And I became the same age as uh, the manager. And then I became the same age as the general manager. <laughs> and so you see this progression and it kind of catches up with you really fast. Uh, and then you're, you kind of feel like you're still the 20 something year old and you are in your mind. But then all of a sudden there's these younger people coming up. And then you are able to give the same type of influence and, and advice to them getting in. So that type of thing really stayed with me from a, from a human standpoint. That is the number one thing out of baseball. I always tell everybody, you can always go into the media guide. You go online now. You can see what these players do. But it's what they do when you're not looking at them in the clothes that we all root for. That's what counts in the game. That's what counts in any type of industry that you do. So that's that was a... Uh, that was a big impactful. That was probably the most impactful thing that happened in the Astrodome. Besides then being able to close out, uh, you know, with the, the final game that turned out to be the final game in the film. Yeah. You know, and Brownie, I got to say, Brownie, who's on the, the call, has been very instrumental to both of us. And that's that's another influence. Uh, Bill Brown has, has always been there anytime we needed help throughout these years. And so he's a prime example, just like, but Brownie has become a very good friend, uh, you know, a very close friend and a close mentor. Uh, to me, there's there's a few people in baseball who I can call that. And uh, so anyway, we, I know we both think. So. Well, and and I'm to, 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 <laughs> to, to piggyback off of him, um, I always tell young broadcasters that, that you know, it's it's more than just between the lines that you're calling the game. It's. The, the most satisfaction that you get out of what we do in the industry of baseball or for sports for that matter, but especially baseball is the relationships that you build. It's the camaraderie that you have with the players, more so the coaches, other newspaper writers, people, even the stadium workers, you get to, you see them on a daily basis and you greet them with a smile. And uh, I've heard a lot of stories about talking about Ben Scully that, he knew a lot of the stadium workers. He took that that time to get to know everybody involved in the in the organization. I have a pretty cool Ben Scully story myself. Um, that uh, you know, before before a game, broadcaster he has his routine. He'll have dinner and he'll he'll look over his notes. And um, usually, about you know thirty minutes before first pitch, he's he's studying, doing last minute notes or and what have you, and he's in that mindset. Well, as you all know, the right across the street from Minute Maid Park is Annunciation, it is the Catholic Church. And before the six o'clock starts that the Astros currently do on Saturdays, they used to do a seven o'clock start. And the mass time at Annunciation is 5.30. So my father and I, um, we went to mass before the game and the Dodgers were in town and uh, communion, and so uh, we're more clump up at the front of the church, we're praying, and I just happened to look, and there is Vin Scully in that blazer going up to communion, and uh, I think Catholics will get a laugh out of this, but usually if you're in a hurry, you leave Mass early after communion, but he didn't. He went back, and he went back and kneeled, and he prayed, and obviously the priest gives our blessing and then dismisses the, the congregation. Well, Vin Scully just took his time. And it's about 635, 640. He just took his time. He walked across Texas Avenue, and I just watched him. And he, he went up in the elevator. And, of course, I, I can only imagine, but he's about to, to tape his open for the television broadcast. And it just seemed like he was in no hurry whatsoever. And in, in that blue blazer, dressed immaculate with the, the, uh, the pocket uh, uh, handkerchief right there, white pocket handkerchief, and you know, he just put those headset on and he just said, it's time for Dodger baseball. Just as smooth as always. And you would have never guessed that he was just like waiting for that that time, but just popped on the air. He was a special, special broadcaster and all that. He's kind of the standard for, for what we do. And for us locally, you know, Brownie. Brownie is a uh, you know, standard for us uh, broadcasters about how he was able to gather all of the media notes, all the stats, and the stories and 
pile it into one and his dissemination of the information on a broadcast was just was very seamless. And to someone that's just a, a casual observer, it's no big deal. But to someone that's the trained ear, it's a marvel. I mean, it's a true marvel of how he was able to do that in his craft. Yeah. 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 Talking about Vince Scully? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Vince Scully worked uh, alone because that was in the old days, uh, broadcasters, they did games by themselves. They, they did games by themselves. It was on, uh, speaking of old time broadcasters, uh, and I posted this on my Facebook page one time, uh, August the 20th, I believe, is uh, National Radio Day. And I talked about the, uh, the uh, I'm sorry, it was, uh, the, the first baseball game on radio was August the 5th, and it was the 100th anniversary. And I posted this, uh, it was the Pirates, 1921, they had the, the first baseball broadcast. And I talked about it. And, uh, you know, back then, the owners didn't want radio broadcasts. They were afraid that the fans would not come to the game and they'd stay home. And that's before television, so they would want to to generate as much revenue as they could off the ticket sales. There was no such thing as television dollars and advertising and all of that, or advertising was in its infancy stages. But owners did not want radio broadcast, and it was that way until probably the late '30s when they figured out, hey, we can make money out of this. There's this is this is a, a revenue stream. And they started to sell advertising on the broadcast. And that's how they were able to, to do that. And of course, the same thing with television. They were afraid of television. Oh, we don't, we're going to lose fans. They're going to people to stay home. Look at that now. It's so, so not the case. But, uh, but yeah, at one time, the owners did not want radio broadcasts. Well, now they're afraid that you're going to watch it on the streams and on your phone, wherever you're at. And it's the same theory. It's just a different technology now. Yeah, it's the same old thing over and over Baseball season starting soon. I want to talk quickly about the the Space Cowboys. Uh, uh, they have they have some ball players that we've seen come up to the big leagues. David Hensley probably is going to make the big league roster. Um, JJ Matajevic, he's been up and down. And uh, I saw Hunter Brown the last couple of years at AAA. He's going to be one that is probably going to be into the Astros' plans uh, going forward. And he has some electric stuff. Uh, when I worked the broadcast, uh, I heard uh, Steve Sparks talk about his release point and how the, the fluid motion that he has and how the, uh, the release point. And, and it was really interesting to hear Sparky get, uh, get into, in, into the, the, uh, the mechanics of a pitcher and so forth. And Brown has really mirrored his mechanics to Justin Verlander. That's who he grew up watching. So if he stays healthy... And, and he seems like, in, in the brief amount of time I was able to be around him, seems like he's got a good head on his shoulders. It's good something in between the ears. So we're really looking forward to seeing what Hunter Brown can do for the Houston Astros. So uh, Justin Dearden's another player. is kind of a mythical Paul Bunyan guy with a beard and doesn't use the batting gloves. And he's hit well this spring. Uh, Kind of an Evan Gass left-handed version, but oh. but a better because he can play the outfield. And he's got he's very fast and he's got a good arm. Uh, Corey Jolks is a guy that hit 31 home runs last year. Corey Jolks is a Friendswood product. He went to Clearbrook High School and he played at University of Houston. And I called his college games. I called his college games and got to see him, uh, you know, play at uh, AAA. Uh, this past year. So those are some of the names that, that we're looking for. I also saw Jake Myers hit three home runs in one game in El Paso at thin air. Uh, that game ended up being 24 to 15. It was a four and a half hour game, which transitions us to the pitch clock and some of the rule changes that are going on in, in baseball. Yeah, I think that some of the rule change, I, I just look at it from a standpoint of, it almost is like, well, I got a lot of it. On, on what's going on. I don't share every one of them, but uh, this is looking at it as a fan and looking at it from somebody else from, from the other side, from the flip side, on the other team side. First, I feel that it's kind of odd that we're essentially micromanaging the game now to show people how to play it right with these clocks. You know, because if you, if you look at how it's evolved, 
and with expansion, all these other pitchers and specialty pitchers that have come out over the past 30 years, 25, 30 years, we kind of, I remember talking about this a long time ago. People are going to start taking longer. You're going to start changing. This is going to become a college game. Uh, guys are going to start jumping around. It's going to look like a high school game. It's supposed to be Major League Baseball. Go out there, you focus, you don't stop, keep going, you keep your head in the game because 90% of the game is half metal, right? That's what Del Gary said, right? So you keep the momentum, the continual going with the baseball game. And that's kind of what's been lost. So it seems like the league has had to come in and micromanage and say, okay, we're going to put these clocks up there and you kids better start adhering to it or we're going to cause strike on you. And I personally, I think that's a shame that we've come to that. But I think it's also a product of all these coaches over the years who had been in this select baseball and all this and that, and these kids being catered to and, and, Oh, it's me, it's me, it's me, it's me. And now when they're showing up at the major league level, this is what you get. So I think this is kind of a course correction. I'm hoping that this type of stuff doesn't last a ton of a time, but I understand why it's there now. Uh, so hopefully we can get major league players back on course to feeling the game and not having to have somebody or some kind of symbol tell them, oh, I got to get back to the box, you know, or I got to pitch, you know. When you're a pitcher, I used to pitch in high school. I used to love striking out people. I had an immaculate inning in high school one time, and I was really proud of that because every time I threw a strike, I was like, okay, I'm not letting that hitter get back out. Like, I'm ready to go, and I here I go. And it's going to look a little wild. It's going to come in. He's not going to be able to check it. There's not a strike. And it's, it's about that. It's about you dominating the head game with the other player on the other end of that. It's between pitcher and batter. So I don't know. That part bothers me personally. As somebody who worked in baseball, somebody who played baseball, somebody who grew up a fan of baseball, that part I have an issue with. And that's about it. I got some issues with some other stuff too. Right? <laughs> Mike and I talked on the phone about this, about – the pace and the rhythm of the game. And I go back and look at box scores all the time. And I was looking at, at game time, length of game. And it was two hours, 15 minutes, two hours, 30 minutes back in the 80s and the 90s. And those are some of the play. I mean, that's the era that I grew up watching baseball. And I go back and watch those games. And it's, there's a pace to it. It's a rhythm to it. And it's the, the, the game that, that we love. And, We've gotten away from that because of all the, like what Mike said, of the, the players now with the select ball and being catered to and just the, 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 the stop and start, stop and start. But baseball is beautiful because of that rhythm that we're all, we've all known and are all accustomed to. Of, uh, it's, it's, it's just a beautiful game. And so hopefully they can, you know, it's, like you said, it's not going to last too long to where they can get back into the habit of playing the game and getting into that rhythm again. Hopefully, this is a this is a thing where the only clock we see is to speed up, you know, hey, throw the ball. And it's not a clock to say the first inning is going to take 10 minutes, right? Because that's the beauty of baseball. It's one seven outs. You can uh, take three hours or five hours. We're almost there, right? Five hours to get 27 outs in one game. <laughs> so that's the beauty of it. It's like life. You have to get out of the scenarios. You have to work through scenarios. You got to work through challenges. And... Uh, and, and beat them. So hopefully that we never, ever get to a point where they put a clock on how, how long an inning lasts. Because I think, uh, and we also had a conversation about this. <laughs> I'm not a fan, I'm going to say it, I am not a fan of the sponsor logo on the uniform. I believe that the baseball uniform is sacred and that Major League Baseball is a brand. I'm a brand and communications guy. And it really is upon the commissioner of a league like David Stern did. We were talking about this in the NBA for a long time. He was against having any type of corporate logos on the uniform. Not only the corporate logos, the manufacturer of the jersey. He looked at an NBA jersey under David Stern's uh, time. There was the only thing was the Jerry West logo. There was no manufacturer on there either. Yeah. And that kind of, I understand as, as years go along and, you know, you go back in the 80s and uh, it was really the 80s you started to see Rawlings, Russell Athletic, uh, Starter. Uh, you know, there's an example, right? This is a, this is actual 90s uh, jacket that I've had since I was in high school. And, it still fits. and, <laughs> and uh, uh, so, you know, it's it's something that we saw evolve. But I think it's one thing to have 
a manufacturer logo on a uniform and then have ad space because then it's just once you set a precedent in baseball or any one of the major sports you're going to have it i mean we've seen it in the world baseball classic it's on the side of the helmet right. and then, you know it's it's just you need a there needs to be, you know, when you're a major league franchise, I remember back when we moved into Minute Maid Park at or Enron Field at the time, I was thinking, what are we going to come to? Are the Houston Astros one day going to be the Enron Houston Astros? You know, the, the NYSE New York Yankees? Are they going to have a title sponsor where they have to say that title sponsor in front of the name? Is that where it's going to go one day? I understand corporate sponsorships. I do. It's how everything is run, how, everything, how you make uh, money in baseball, how you make money in anything, really, right? You got to do business. But I think there's a difference in the business of baseball versus understanding the game of baseball and how it should be run as a business. If you have an understanding of how the game works, then you can run it as a business effectively. And I think that's where we've gone a little askew, you know, back about seven, it was right about the time Manfred came in. They had a bloodbath at MLB. They got rid of a ton of good baseball people, people that had worked there for years, people who knew the game or who were, who were well educated in the game. And they brought in a bunch of Ivy League people who were bottom line numbers people, business people. And what, what do you get, right? You get somebody who has worked retail for a national retail chain making decisions about the game of baseball. And what are you going to get? You're going to start seeing that type of stuff and everybody's going to stand behind it. Yes, it's, that's what we should do and everything's good, but there is an integrity that I believe should be held in baseball. And I'll say that probably, at least in Texas, the, the I think the best people doing it are the Ryan Sanders group, uh, the guys that own the uh, Round Rock Express and the San Antonio Missions. Lee Ryan and uh, Don Sanders and Nolan Ryan's involved in that group. That's that is a that is a royalty of baseball that we have here in Texas, and they really understand the game and how the game should be monetized because they take the fans into account. They take the integrity of the game into account, account as well. So that's and, that's my little. And how to how it would she actually go to bail Bob? <laughs> <laughs> well, see that's the other thing too. So. So like, so so think about that, right? So say even if the uh, so okay, I don't know. If say this, but, but, uh, so so uh, back in 2020, uh, so we were uh, we were approaching the 60th anniversary of the uh, uh, franchise, and so we had started to do some prep work, you know, in 2020. And there was a decision made, hey, let's do a bunch of uh, throwback games this year. And I used to handle a lot of that stuff. And so I, I, I said, okay, well, let me look at which uniforms we should do, which ones we've done before. Let's try to mix it up. Let's try to do something really neat, some uniforms that maybe people haven't seen. Uh, and then we can make it available to store and you can make money, right? Do that, right? Okay. So we had that all lined up. But that was also the year where we were transitioning to the Nike swoosh on the uniform. And that process used to be, see, there's, you have sponsors and then you have your major league base and you have your team, right? And the team buys uniforms from this vendor, right? They're a customer of the vendor. Well, at some point, and I knew this was going to happen, the vendor has gotten so big in their head where they tell the team, you know, we don't want to do those. We don't, we, we're, we don't want y'all to do uh, throwback uniforms. No. <laughs> and, and, and I thought, okay, hold on, hold on, Codman. <laughs> this is a revenue generator for you and for us. And we're going to sell these as game use and we're going to sell them in the stores, but we're also going to buy a ton of these uniforms from you. I mean, it's, you're talking about a big dollar amount the teams spend every year on buying uniforms. But to have that happen, that's where I came back to the integrity of the game. How dare a, a vendor tell a major league club you can't wear that own your own old uniform? We don't want to make it. And that's where it's the responsibility of the commissioner uphold that type of stuff. The power should be with the team. And as long as Major League Baseball says, go ahead and do it, and they give their blessing, and you have the rights to those 
colors and logos, you know, like you know, most of these teams do, then you should be able to do it. Because guess who wants to see it? Who doesn't want to see that here? Raise your hand. Who would not like to see a throwback? Right? So most people enjoy that at a game. But that's where that's one of the other little things. And, and you see this now, especially with Nike, that they impose their will on these franchises, whether it be MLB, NBA, college, whatever, that they start influencing how the uniforms are, the, the design, the look, and they want to say, okay, let's let's do this. And you see that all the time. Unfortunately, in the NBA, it's like there's the team's got five different uniforms and they have to wear each uniform a minimum of 10 times per contract through the league of, uh, and Nike. So Nike is really pushing, pushing, pushing. And it's where it should be. The team says, like the Celtics, they say, no, we're going to wear the traditional whites with the green and the, gr and the green and the white on the road. And there's, there was a, a struggle there because the Celtics traditional franchise a lot like the Yankees. The Yankees, for the longest time, didn't put the uniform manufacturer on their jersey until Nike. By the way, real quick, do you all know what year it was that the first manufacturer went on the jersey? The MLB jersey? Do you all remember what year? 1987. But back then, it was done very discreet. Like Classic. This, like this. Now you've got the big swish along with uniform patches. So um, I don't know how much time we have, but um, I mentioned Astro Talk earlier, which is a project that I had for a long time. And uh, when I left the Astros on a full-time basis, I still stay involved with the Astros Hall thing. Uh, going over there, we have a meeting. That, you know, We bring our, our committee together. And we uh, and Brownie is, is part of that committee. He didn't have any say this time <laughs> because we had the... the uh, Unanimous vote of the uh, the committee to to elect him this year, well deserved, and I love still being involved with that and showing up on uh, Hall of Fame Day and being involved with his festivities because I again people that are involved with the game were, was like the, the best thing. So when I see the legacies protected of these great people who have done something for the franchise, it's it's very heartwarming. It's very rewarding personally. Because, you know, these are people who I grew up listening to or watching. Now I had something to do with the preservation of their legacy here in this ballpark forever. But them getting a jacket, putting a plaque in the ballpark, and they get a replica plaque as well. And that's the stage that we're at right now is all that's getting approved. And I don't know if Brownie has gone through his first sizing yet for his jacket, but I know that that would be approaching very soon. Um, but we have this Astro Talk that we are going to uh, turn into a podcast. Now, before I left the Astros on a full-time basis, I had started work on an Astros Talk podcast to do. Uh, was, this was in the summer of 2019. And then um, we did construction in the ballpark in the off-season where the recording studio is, and we weren't able to record anything. We were going to start. So, all right, well, let's start doing it, you know, at the end of spring training in 2020. Well, <laughs> that great year came by, and then, um, you know, it happened. And there were layoffs throughout baseball. That's what happened to me. And so we took, we decided to take Astro Talk uh, private. And like I said earlier, we have such an appreciation for the game of baseball and broadcasting that we decided to have a show of our own where we will have uh, former players, uh, people like Bill Brown, you know, Joe, having you on there to talk as well. You know, we had you on for an inning uh, last year or an inning or two last year over at the Space Cowboys game. Uh, and really involve uh, a lot of great conversation. Because one of the things that I have noticed, which is part of life, right? Uh, Bob Watson, Jimmy Wynn, you know, guys like that, they've passed on. And so it's, a, it's an opportunity to get these guys have a, a record of them talking about these in-depth stories that they had throughout baseball. So it's something that'll be there forever. So that's part of of uh, the project we're doing. It's now connected to the to the media company that I'm a part owner of with Houston City Beach, which is a broader project dealing with the city of Houston. Uh, and then Gerald, of course, has Legacy Sports Network where he runs all his broadcasts. Um, and then real briefly, I also own uh, a new company called Astrodome Reimagine. That's, um, that's a company that will focus on the past, present, and 
future development of the Astro. And we have a Facebook page. We have an Instagram page for Astronome Reimagined, where we're starting to put content out. We're going to start rolling out other stuff uh, pertaining to the future somewhat soon. <laughs> but anyway, we have, uh, we have those. And uh, I guess if anybody has questions, um, we can have some questions or, or not. Q&A. Yes, sir. Thank you, Riel. Thank you. Yes and no. <laughs> Don't know if it's with the Astros, but he's he's got talent. I mean, he's got he's got some pop. He's got a good arm, good, some, some speed. I don't know if there's a spot for him in, in, on the, the the major league roster. It's like what we saw a lot of times with Hunter Brown is that the roster was so stacked at the major league level. These guys are just a triple A, like Corey Jolks. You would expect him to be on a major league roster just about anywhere else. But he's still at AAA uh, in the uh, Astros organization. Depending on the length of the of, from wherever they're traveling to. So, like for example, in the Pacific Coast League, they fly everywhere except Round Rock, which is a bus trip to to Round Rock. But they'll fly to Tacoma or to Sacramento or to El Paso, and uh, then a bus trip to Round Rock. Yes, sir. Me personally, no, I was not there. So. They're a cool organization. They have a pretty good frame of mind how they they made it the greatest show in baseball, you know, as an entertainment value. Uh, so their value proposition that they push out to the fans is it's really nice. You know, it's good. They have legitimate players, uh, but you know, they they've put together quite a attention together. Yes, sir. Uh, since you're <clears throat> from Victoria, start calling Victoria boys and basketball uh, boys and football games, basketball games. I started yes, I started doing high school games in Victoria for Victoria High and Stroman and my alma mater, St. Joseph, which is the same alma mater as uh, former Houston Astro Doug Drabeck. Did you call the East Central Victoria game in '93? I think it was. In in boys basketball? Yes. No, but I remember I was in high school. He was six years old. <laughs> that was a that was a, a great game. Uh, that was played at, at Convocation Center in San Antonio, and uh, yeah, I remember that game. So, Gerald, I got a question. Uh, looking back on your broadcast career, have you ever thought to yourself, "Man, I actually called a guy where called a game where this guy played in it." Is a big star? Anybody like that? It's a lot of people. A lot of people. Well, do you have anybody that really sticks out the biggest star, maybe that you want to? Well, I, I would say, uh, let's see, you pick a sport, and there's baseball. Teams. Okay, baseball. Uh, well, there's Matt Carpenter. I called Matt Carpenter. I called uh, 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 Paul Goldschmidt. He was playing for the Woodlands. Thank you. Uh, Paul Anthony Rendon. He was playing at Lamar High School, and I saw him at Rice. And uh, goodness gracious, uh, Michael Bourne. Michael, Michael Bourne played at, at yeah. Nimitz and then he played at University of Houston. Yes, sir. 2003. Who's the last well, and James Loney. Uh, Matt James Loney was the year before, 2002. Brad Lincoln, who played with the Pirates, uh, was the pitcher for Brasswood, and he he was the starting pitcher. The coach took him out, put him at third base, and then brought him back in. But he was gassed in the seventh inning, and he threw a wild pitch, and that ended up being the, the winning run. So Matt Carpenter and Brad Lincoln, last major leaguers to play. Uh, in the Great series, last major leaguer to play. In the dome. Now Carpenter didn't hit a home run in that game. We had, well, uh, Lance Pendleton, who played with the Astros, uh, played at Kingwood, and Kingwood and Elkins played the very first high school baseball game in, at Minute Maid Park, and that was in two thousand two. Yeah. So James Loney was a part of that game with Matt Carpenter and. And Lance Pendleton for King. Yeah. 
Yeah. The first the first uh game we ever broadcasted it's a football game together, first game together. And the equipment, we had a malfunction with the equipment. It was over there in the South Sun State. We had to pass back and forth the phone. That's how we had to call the game. We, we, had, to, we had to call the game through a phone line on the ISDN line. Well, uh, my understanding is they hired a firm to uh, to to rebrand. And the reason that they changed to this from Skeeters to Space Cowboys is because they wanted to keep in line with the space theme. Of the Houston space name, they felt that you know Jim Crane's group felt that they could monetize and market it better as the uh, Space Cowboys rather than the Steelers. So, and one of the things that that and I think that many of you all might remember, and a lot of the twenty uh, somethings, they all think it's cool because of the they call me the Space Cowboy, the song by Steve Miller called the Joker, but in reality. Steve Miller, who is from Dallas, his first single release was in 1969 called Space Cowboy. They call me the Space Cowboy. Bet you weren't ready for that. And I was telling that to the young guys there in the in the ballpark. They had no clue. They thought, oh, this is cool. The Joker. Some call me the you know Space Cowboy. Some call me the Gangster of Love. I said, no, actually, that came from his first single that was released in 69, which didn't chart. But it was still released at the same. See, he knows that because the year we met, 99, he was working for the radio station in Victoria, and he was a disc jockey doing all the music, and I was sitting in the broadcasting. That's how, so yeah. that's how he has his up to par with the music. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> 92.5. It'll be on, uh, yes, ESP, ESPN, the, uh, the affiliate, yes. ESPN affiliate, 92.5. Yes, sir. The last college baseball game played at the uh, the last college baseball game played at the dome. I should know this. Say the H game. I'm not thinking. No, Beller played there. Uh, I do remember that uh, UH played an exhibition game there at, at against the Astros in the seventies. And uh, uh, but I don't I don't know the last the last game college game played. In I know they had they had um, like a super regional there one time, maybe in the eighties, the nineties. I don't think it was there in the nineties. Uh, I know I know that the, uh, I know that they had a Mexican league game there in April of ninety three. Uh, it was the first Mexican league game played in the United States uh, there. Um, yeah, it was a game. The card they played. Astros Cardinals played on a Sunday afternoon, yeah. and then the Mexican League game was right after. Yeah, but I don't think uh, I'm going back because I've seen. I don't see anywhere on that docket before that there was a collegiate game that I could be wrong. Uh, but it was uh, the single regional that I seen. Sometimes yeah, I don't know if it was ever at the Astros. Yeah, yeah. Was, was it? Yeah. Oh, okay. That might be a Bill Cousins question. Okay. I, I yes, yes, sir. Deacon Jones, former yeah. hitting coach of the Astros in the early 80s, and then he was a wins hitting coach in San Diego. He is kind of the baseball ambassador in Sugar Land. They have his... Uh, he comes around, his, his health is failing, and he's but he still comes around. So Deacon Jones has his number retired in Sugarland, along with Gary Gaetti, the longtime manager of the Skeeters, who was a former ball player for the uh, uh, for the uh, the Twins, and he uh, he uh, he ended his career with the, the Astros. He played briefly with the Astros. <laughs> Right, right. The team, uh, host teams, yeah, host teams that they they would do. Good man, good man. A lot of stories. Yeah. So, Mike, what can you? Uh, you know, I'm going to ask you an astronaut question. 
Uh, what's the latest on Astrodome reimagined? I mean, what 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 is going on? Is it is it politics that just turned into politics with the dome? I mean, so what are they gonna do? <laughs> uh feel free to talk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so astronomically imagined evolve. So I sit on the board of the astronaut conservancy. I have for this will be my fourth year. And I've I've had relationships with various people over the years who are part of the, the key stakeholders. And now they have taken the other prominent positions with these stakeholders. And number one, yes, it is highly political. Yeah. Okay. It is this is like a political campaign. Everything is strategic. Um very briefly, the simplest that I can put it is I have been a little frustrated with the hands being tied by different organizations because of the political process. And so I decided to do something a little different, think outside the box and create Astrodome Reimagined LLC. And I have some key partners with this. And we are trying to really see the future of the Astrodome happen a lot sooner than everybody expects. And that's the key goal right now. The Astrodome in the future is going to have to be publicly accessible. It's going to have to make money. And it's going to have to satisfy the needs of the main stakeholders at NRG Park, which are the Texans, the Rodeo, and the Harris County Sports and Convention Corporation, who is essentially what the Astros were when they were there. They're, they're the landlords of NRG Park. And they're also um, an entity of Harris County. So those <clears throat> dots have been millions of miles apart in the past. And so I've navigated some things and, um, and I've been here to speak to the group before, you know, and so some of y'all have been here. And I've taken all that, and like I said, we created Afghan Reimagined, and we we're trying to do something that hasn't been done before, but that we are doing things now. I can't really talk too much about it, but we're doing things now that have never been done in this project. And so it's all behind the scenes. I hate to be very coy like that, but um, we have a lot of things going on. There's a lot of moving parts, but the way I kind of see my role in this is a concierge, and I'm trying to connect everybody and trying to get the relationships back on track. And so um, that means doing something that the county has not been able to do. Got it. <laughs> Got you. So, um, so anyway, that's uh, that's that's kind of what's going on there. So we did activate. Uh, we will have astronomreimagine.com. We have astronomreimagine on Facebook, Instagram. We'll have a Twitter. We will have LinkedIn. We'll have all this engagement. Um, so when more information comes out, you will already see it. You'll already be a part of it. And hopefully share it. And uh, we have uh, we have a lot of good things coming up. Uh, we have some key people that are involved with this project that we haven't. Um, some key people that had were very instrumental in the building of the Astrodome. That I'm very happy to have them part of this LLC. And and then um, another key uh, partner with mine of mine who. Uh, we own Houston City Beat together, and her name is Lisbeth uh, Marquez, and she has been instrumental. Let's just put it this way: she went and stood. <laughs> uh, and this this might sound a little blown up, but um, we were at the rodeo recently, and she went and saw the statue of Vivian Smith, and I said, "Wow, this is kind of ironic uh, because there hasn't really been paperwork with a woman's name on it." like this since the days of Vivian Smith. <laughs> and uh, she was like, well, who, you know, she didn't understand, so I explained who Vivian. Vivian Smith was the wife of Ari Bob Smith, who's one of the original owners of the Astros, and also the, the establishers of the Houston Sports Association, which was the parent company of the Astros, and oversaw the Astros being built, with Juan McGoy, Hoffman, and Frank Holland, and George Kersey. So that that was kind of unique, you know. Uh, even though we're we're at certain stages right now, but, um, but yeah, that's that's kind of what's going on. Yeah.
Um, I know you've done a lot of studies. Are actually could it be a decent casino if they liberalize? So that is a totally different conversation. That so see what I'm working in is realities. Yeah, and so. What are the realities? And I think that there's been too many people with pipe dreams, right? And they once thought that the Astrodome was a pipe dream. And, and I told the architects several years ago when they were just gonna, when the county approved $105 million for this first stage of the deal that the current administration killed, um, I said, look, this process to get the dome redeveloped is gonna be much more difficult than it was to actually construct the Astrodome. I'm telling you right now, it's, it's gonna be a lot more challenging because you want to talk about something that's never been done before, there's never really been a major stadium like this, much less something like the Astrodome that has been uh, reestablished as another building that is going to have uh, just as, a, as much of an impact to the complex that it's part of as it did as it started that same complex. Uh, and you, you have to get your mind out of putting a ski slope or putting a casino only in it. You have to think of multifaceted stuff and many different pieces of a puzzle that come together with key stakeholders that come together and understanding which order you have to follow how this train is put together who's driving the train who's getting the goods out of the train all that stuff so if the texas state legislature in the future <laughs> wants to approve gambling in texas that's fine but this is 2023 the Astros played there in 1999. I'm nearly 50 now. Yeah. I started there when I was 24, and I'm a little upset by that. And I'm a Harris County citizen, and I've, I've got a lot of relationships over the years to where I, I just felt it was time to do something that the people we elect couldn't do. Hopefully, it falls through. <laughs> Anybody else? What's the largest baseball crowd ever in Astrodome? It was a game in 1998. Uh, and it was uh, it was a Randy Johnson game, I believe. It was in late the season, September. I want to say it was like September 12th or 14th, somewhere right in there. There were uh, fi almost 57,000 people in the Astrodome. The capacity for the Astrodome originally was, with standing room only, was about 48 and, and change. Uh, and then when they expanded the seating in the late 80s, it was um, almost 54,000 permanent seats. And so with standing room and selling all those extra, as many people as you could squeeze into the concourses and mezzanine down the lines and such without, um, uh, you know, alerting the fire marshal, you know, it was it was almost 50, 50. I believe it was out the, the pirates. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, it was that game. And of course. I remember at the time thinking, uh, and I think we have talked about this before, you knew that Minute Maid Park or Enron Field was on the horizon because it was already under construction. And you knew that it was not even going to seat 50,000, it was going to seat like 43 maximum capacity. So I remember thinking, this is probably, unless we, we build another dome stadium, you know, down the line, uh, or the Astros move back or whatever, uh, which is not going to happen, not, not in this lifetime. Um, then, then, uh, once I shift gears on the team too, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, but anyway, um, that was going to be the largest, uh, baseball crowd in history, uh, in Texas, you know, now, or in Houston, at least when you look at the new stadium in Arlington, uh, Globe Life Field, right, parties at Parker Field, which is Field, field um, I don't know if the capacity is there. But I don't think it's I don't think it's more about it's 40, it's 40, yeah, I, I want to say it's it's under 50,000. Yeah, I think it's all other than the yeah, and that's that's kind of that's done by design. Uh, mm -hmm. because and you talk about the Astrodome, it introduced all these segments of the building. So you know, you start learning you can make this amount of money on your club level, this amount of money on your loge level, uh, your skyboxes that evolves into what you see today, premium seating. Your premium seating. And restaurants and a very skinny upper deck. A lot of these, a lot of these, these modern stadiums because they want premium seats. And the, the, the press box for radio broadcasters are always at the top. Yeah, the yeah. new ballparks. And also not always behind home plate. They're like behind first base, you know, or even down the line. I think uh, a couple of bases. Yeah. So. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm.
one of my favorite is after own period. Longest single in major league history was hitting. <laughs> that was a shit. Was, uh, yeah, Mike Schmidt, 774. I was there. You were you? I was there underneath the I had a home. Well, <laughs> I that speech, I said, you got it. Yeah. So one of the things I like to do on the Space Cowboy broadcast, I always like to do this date in baseball history or this date in Astros history. I try to mainly around Astros history, but I'll throw in the other stuff too. But that was one of the things I talked about. Uh, in 74, with the uh, ball hitting the speaker, Mike Schmidt having the longest single ever. They had to raise that speaker. Yeah. 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 Everybody sees Savannah looking like he's going to catch the ball, so they're holding the ball, hits on the turf, and catching it, coming up with them, and fire the strike in a second. All under the fans, one base, and she the first one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. And then they had to raise that one. So that speaker in particular, you have 12 speakers, or you had 13 back then. Uh, there were 12 speakers hanging throughout the, the dome because the dome was designed, designed in 12 pie sections. So there was one large speaker. Cluster speakers per pie section. And the one in center, it was right in front of the American flag above the, the, the wagon gate tunnel. You know, uh, the wagon gate, gate, gate. Gate. <laughs> uh, that one was down a little bit lower and it was it was facing towards the field where the uh, the other ones were facing towards the stands. So you could so if you were in the stands, you could hear this. Um, and then they had to raise that speaker right after that. They they lifted it up. So if you look at some of these old pictures in the dome. In the 60s, you'll notice there's a speaker, you know, the other one in the outfield's hanging this way, this one's hanging kind of this, this direction towards the field so the players could hear, and then they raised it up. And then eventually, later on in the mid-80s, they got rid of it because they, they replaced all 12 of those, those clusters. That's what we have today. Anyway. The Homer Nights in three years now, right? Oh, the Fomer Nights. Yeah, yeah, Fomer Nights. Yeah. You know, uh, I, when I think of Fomer Night, I think of, uh, I always think of Jamie Hildreth for, for some reason. He had a really good Fomer Night story. And I think the best uh, Fomer Night, Jamie Hildreth was, a, was, was really a mentor to us as well. You don't know who Jamie Hildreth was. He was a guy who started in Houston Radio and then he worked as the director of broadcasting for the Astros. He's a guy who hired me and he was a guy who knew everybody. Who knew how to talk to people, how to bring in the head of Budweiser, whoever it was, and really get down on a human level and talk to them as people, develop good relationships with people. He wasn't just selling them, he was he's really selling them an, ex an experience, you know, with the Astros. But anyway, the Fomer night, I think one of the, the most interesting, you know, the so Larry Durker had a note hitter in 1976. And they had the back then, because it started the Fomer night started out as a home run. His light comes on on the scoreboard, the big scoreboard across the outfield. The light was on, the Astros hit a home run, free beer for the rest of the inning, right? Okay, you can't do that today. But they were doing it at the time where the Astros, they, they had a 500 record in 72. And then after that, it wasn't until the late 70s before they got better again, right? So they were going through this, this downturn and they were trying to come up with ways uh, to improve. And you also have to consider, too, that the team was in a lot of financial trouble. Offlines had lost control of the club, and creditors were involved. So they were really trying to get as many people in there as possible. So this is one of those, those typical baseball stunts that are kind of fun that would never fly today. So there wasn't a lot of power with the Astros in the early 70s. So they switched it to pitching. And uh, when Durker was out there in 76, he struck out uh, Pete McAdam, McAdam, right? Uh, McCannon, McCann, thank you. He was with the Expos, and it was in the eighth inning. And all the people, you know, it's 13,000 people there. It was July 8th, I think, July 7th, or 76th, 9th. 9th, thank you. See, I taught him well. <laughs> no, uh, so so the, all these people raised their stands, and uh, they forgot that Larry Durkin was throwing a no hitter. And so he finished out the no hitter, and everybody's partying in the concourse is doing free beer. And a lot of them missed the last out of the game. Because they went for their Fomer night beer, and he he actually laughs at that. If you ever see him asking about the Fomer night, because he he still gets a real good kick out of that. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's it's a great story. May I tell that's one story because I always remember September, kids back to school. So this is going to be a So I'm working in the oil and gas industry. So I have to take the for a game. And no one Ryan, if you all remember, he pitched, he would grunt. He would yes. Go, boom. Dave Parks at the plate, and that back stuck. Dave, no one hit him right in the top of his head. The ball went about 15 feet up there. He came down like second chance. You could hear the noise stunning. So the wonderful crowd was maybe even 5,000 people. Yeah, yeah. And right in the head of the street, he looked down at the sack of potatoes. No one just looked at him, sick and sound. And then eventually got up, dust himself off, clean his that back. Wow. Yeah. Was just, so oh, yeah. Stay out. And then, of course, you have the echo. Well, yeah. So you probably hear that. Yeah. You know, Ooh, smaller crowds. There's, there's a, a known Ryan story I've said on the air before. Larry Durker told this story one time. I remember this, but. Of course, Dirk's got so many stories, but Ryan's pitching in the dome and they're playing the Reds. George Foster is at the plate. And Foster, right handed batter with the Reds, is he's, you know, power hitter, 50 home runs, I believe, in 77. And did he at bat? So Ryan's first pitch comes in there, zoom, strike one. Ashby catches it. Home plate umpire calls strike one, strike one. And Foster's upset. He says, he says, I want you to check that ball because he was to say he thought there's no way that Ryan could throw that fastball like that. Well, Ashby threw it back, and you know Ryan walks around the mound, the cap, and high leg kick, and here he goes again. Shoot, strike two. Now Foster's really upset, and he looks back at the umpire. You better check that bleeping, bleeping baseball. And so Ashby throws it back. Ryan, you know, tugs the cap like he'd always do, and chew that gum, and then high leg kick. That ball's coming right at Foster's head. Foster's eyes get big. The helmet pops off. He lands on his butt on the right-handed batter's box. Ashby catches it. Ryan starts walking towards the plate, and he says, you wanted to check that ball? And snaps that ball back. That's one of my favorite Nolan Ryan stories about hitting a, almost hitting a guy. That's why I love him to take place and listen to everything Nolan said. You know, he always was a proponent of throwing fastball as a kid. Not to worry about throwing curves, it's those strikes, right? Concentrate on throwing overhand. And, and I loved his presence on the mound because he just wouldn't think anything on the mound. And it, it, all the great pitchers, like, they have that, that presence on the mound. They, they are in control. And Nolan was one of those guys. Randy Johnson, Kurt Schilling. Uh, uh, yeah, those, those guys were in control and, and, and couldn't do anything about it. Roger was another guy. Roger Clemens was another guy that I remember. Mm -hmm. Bob Gibson going back before the before my generation, but my father would tell me stories of uh, Gibson. My father, and I'll share real quick with y'all. I was very close with my father. He passed in November. He was 88 years old, and he's the one that really raised me in the game of baseball. And he would take me to the Astrodome from Victoria, and he would he would share the game and share the stories that he, as a young boy, would see Bob Feller and Ted Williams and Stan Musial, and he got to see Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris play in person when he lived up on the East Coast. And he would tell me great stories of the 69 Mets or the 80 Astros. And of course, I fell in love with the Astros in 86 and that great year. Um, but my, my grandfather who played in barnstorming leagues passed on his love of the game to my father. And then my father passed it on to my brothers and I. And that's that's the beauty of baseball. It's just passed on from generation to generation. And the past lends itself so much to the present. And that's what I try to talk about on the broadcast, is that I try to keep the integrity of the game and the game moving, but tie it into the past because we've got a rich history here in Houston. Baseball is a rich history, but especially uh, with, with us here in Houston. And it's that time now. To, to share those stories. And that's what we're going to try to do, but what we will do with, with Astro Talk. Uh, my favorite block, Gibson. Gibson Flat. Okay. I have the back. <laughs> no. 
No, those guys never, they, yeah, they never forgot. Anything else? Anybody else? Well, did any common caps like when I go to iHeartRadio or I mean, I we haven't we haven't recorded the first one yet. Okay. But what we've done is uh, aspirin talk is multifaceted. I love that term because that means you have you have different ways of getting the content. Okay. And so you can get it on Twitter through Astros Talk or Houston City B. You have Astro Talk information there. You can see visuals, pictures, stories, short uh, vignettes. And then we also have uh, video clips that are part of the Houston City B episodes. So they're about, uh, they range between four to five minutes long. And they, they focus on these stories as well. Um, and they have graphics and their storytelling. Uh, but then the, the, the podcast is going to be a conversation. So that's that's a different element. So there's different ways of getting your astro education. <laughs> and that's so, Astro Talk on Twitter. Twitter. Astro Talk on Twitter. Twitter. And then there's an Astro Talk Instagram. Uh, and then on on recentcitybeat.com and all the Facebook and all those. That's yeah, where we're going yeah, to have the Astro Talk features there as well. I don't know if you guys want to go on YouTube. Second and extra hands. I hate that. Yeah. <laughs> is it kind of staying? Is it staying? Yeah. Remember what I said that we're kind of micromanaging the game right now? I think that that's part of the symptom of what we're seeing in the game today. Uh, and hopefully that can go away. Hopefully this is a short lived thing um, and we can just play the game. They don't do it in college baseball and they don't do it in high school baseball. It's not yet. Well, thank you guys. Yes, yeah, stand right here. Hey, uh, okay, so Gerald and uh, Mike are going to get a selfie with everybody. I, I, th I think this is a Zoom first. All right, this is good. One, two, and three. All right, cool. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. One of the reasons I love uh, Saber and one of the reasons I love baseball so much is that every once in a while, you get as much local history when it comes to your, your sport, your game, baseball. They, you get guys like Mike Acosta and Gerald to show up as, you know, kind of, I'll say it, you're kind of younger guy, my age, all right? Look at all this history y'all have. This this, this I know, I know it's crazy, ain't it? This wealth of knowledge and as much experience as they have, not only with the Astros, but with the Cougars, with Houston baseball, with the Astrodome. One of the reasons I love uh, coming to these meetings. Okay, so uh, thank you, Gerald. Thank you, Mike. Looking forward to another great season. And whatever y'all do in the future, feel free to let us all know. We'll help you any way we can. Okay, so good news, bad news. Um, our trivia contest winner from last month, Vince. Um, I don't know if he wants me to tell him tell this, but I'll probably tell him. I'll go and tell him. Uh, he, he's not here tonight because he, if I heard him right, uh, he, he kind of cracked a tooth at lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no trivia contest tonight. Uh, and I said, uh, you want to push it back to April? He didn't respond, so maybe he's in a lot of pain or something. You know, so um, there's no trivia contest tonight. Uh, so we'll have to do it in April. So that's kind of all I have. You're free. You're free to go. Don't forget the meeting next month, April the uh, 17th, I believe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Bob, you want to talk a, a minute or so? We have, uh, we're having our, uh, is this our very first yeah. inaugural chapter fantasy baseball league? Folks signed up. Have, uh, fantasy baseball through the ESPN website. They host lots and lots of leagues. So I chatted with a couple of the guys I know in the league. I don't know what his name is in the basis. So if anyone else is one of those 14 guys, we need to follow up with me after the meeting tonight. I have a help. Uh, Mike says to me Wednesday night, and we're going to have the practice tomorrow. 
Uh, it's called a mock draft. And you talk, I sent out an invite. Um, Zoom call, these mock drafts, you don't really, you don't really reserve space in ESPN like you do for the room. It's Wednesday. So anyway, for those guys that are going to participate, once you can figure out how to do the chat, should be fun. And uh, Carl Owens, really, he's been guiding me. He's very experienced with the way ESPN does fantasy baseball. He explained that we're going to have a playoffs and a champion. So as the season progresses, we'll give you updates at our meetings as like who's in first place, who's chasing that guy. We all gonna have one of those on So Bob, I was gonna ask you, and do, do you mind if I uh, ask you guys every month to give an update on the standings of the fantasy baseball league so we could uh, see who's in first and maybe who's 14th? <laughs> you know, if you don't mind giving an update once a month, it should be fun. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, is that it, Bob? Yeah. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you. So, yes, John. How do we buy the book? Which book? Uh, <laughs> Bill Burton. Uh, the one you got the Bill Burton. There you go. Here's the, here. Well, I know, but I mean, how do you? Just tear a page out. No, 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 please. Book is not the written page is not online. This book is not cheap. <laughs> no, it's brand new though. It's great. Right. It, it, it's uh brand new. So uh you can get it on Amazon. And as I have you already heard today, I have a new copy. I thought you got a stack of them. Oh well no, this is uh something else. All right, but uh no, I don't have a stack of this. No, no. Uh, remember, I just came back from a cruise, so I got no money. <laughs> so, um, yeah, if you want to copy of this, Amazon has it. Uh, a lot of great stories about Bill Burton in here. Um, I, I know there is. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. But, again, that's all we have for this month. We'll see you next month. And remember, if you want to go to the Space Cowboys game, go ahead and uh, mail your check to Mike McCroskey before May 1st. All right? See you next month, everybody. Bye-bye. Go Astros, right? And go Coop! <laughs> Go Astros!